Our first reading this morning comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 15, verses 1 to 8, and it can be found on page 878 in your pew Bible. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Well, our second reading today is from the book of Acts, which, remember, I've mentioned before, is the Gospel according to St. Luke, volume 2. The same person wrote both of these books. This is the second chapter of this exciting story. And here we read uh, about the early church and, and uh, some of the things that happened there. And in this colorful story in Acts chapter 8, we're going to be focusing on today, verses 26 through 40. We read, Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked him, Do you understand what you're reading? He replied, Well, how can I? unless someone guides me. And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now, the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb, silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself or about somebody else? Then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop. And both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let's pause for a moment of prayer before we reflect today, shall we? Oh God, we give you thanks again for your presence with us today. We come before you in humility, 
and we seek your presence in our lives. We seek you to speak to the specific situations we're experiencing uh, in our lives and pray that as we study your word, we would be strengthened by your spirit for them. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a man anxiously paces back and forth in his living room. He glances at his watch and and very hesitantly says down the hall to his wife, very politely, "Uh, Honey, are you ready yet? Uh, We're going to be late for the costume party. Well, frustrated that he asked again, his wife replies, For crying out loud, Ed, I've been telling you for an hour that I'll be ready in a minute. I like that one. In our house, it's, it's usually the other way around. I'm usually the one that's being dragged out of the door for being too slow. Because getting ready uh, for important things... Well, it takes time. You know, it requires patience because it oftentimes requires hard work. You know, this is true uh, when getting ready for a costume party or another important event, but it's also true about evangelism. Uh, if we hope to fruitfully share Christ's love with other people in a way that they can understand and receive it, then we must be properly prepared. We must be primed, if you will, by that same love so that we can share it in a way that it's received. And our story this morning from the book of Acts speaks right to this because it illustrates the miracles that can happen when we've been prepared beforehand by God's love to share it. Uh, This story pops up every few years in various lectionary readings because it's a a wonderful story. In, In verse 27 of our passage, we read about an official. The word in the Greek used to describe him uh, literally um, is defined as ruler. A ruler who was sitting in his chariot on the side of a road outside of Jerusalem. Now, this ruler is referred to in the text as an ethiops, you know, which sounds uh, more like a mythical creature than a human being, uh, an ethiops, but uh, it actually appears in many of our English translations as an Ethiopian, only because Ethiopian kind of sounds like ethiops in a, in a weird kind of way. But I've mentioned in the past, however, that Ethiops was actually a term used in the ancient world to describe citizens of a great kingdom uh, that had a different culture than Ethiopia. It was a kingdom located up the Nile from Egypt. And um, uh, it, it, historians call this ancient African kingdom, which was extraordinarily wealthy and influential, they call it Nubia. And the text tells us that this Nubian official's role in the kingdom, here in the chariot, uh, was to manage the wealth of the current Kandake, which is just the Nubian word for queen. Uh, it's, it's not a, a uh, proper name, but it's just like saying king or queen. Uh, so uh, he was ruling um, in, by controlling the wealth of this Kandake. Now, because Nubia was so wealthy and influential, uh, his job wasn't the equivalent of, you know, guarding a a piggy bank uh, somewhere or something like that. He managed a a sizable national treasure. He was a powerful man who we're told in verse 27 had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Now, 
this sounds really weird when we learn a little bit more about the context. See, people's individual religious beliefs in ancient societies, they were really diverse, just as people's beliefs throughout the world are today. And this was true in Nubia as well. But in Nubia, most people, uh, I guess you could say as close to what you came to uh, state religion uh, as you could come to, uh, most people worshipped the same three primary gods that the Egyptians and other people in the region worshipped. You know, most Nubians worshipped, for example, Osiris, you know, who was thought to be the first pharaoh of, of Egypt in some distant mythical past, but now currently ruled the underworld. Uh, they also worshipped Osiris's son, Horus, a god with, with bird-like features who ruled the sky, who, who Egyptians believed was their current pharaoh, you know, Horus incarnated. Um, and, and in addition to Osiris and Horus, they, they also worshipped uh, Osiris's wife, the, the goddess Isis, who was a multifaceted deity. And she had temples located up and down the Nile. So uh, she was very popular. So, so most Nubians, they didn't worship Yahweh, the, the, the Jewish god. But this... Nubian ruler, an important person, apparently did. You know, he was in Jerusalem, worshipping, and, and, and he was reading the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, how could this be? Well, yeah, I've mentioned before that the book of Acts, in many places, describes people it refers to as God-fearers. These, these people from a variety of different religious backgrounds who worshipped in Jewish synagogues throughout the Roman Empire and in the temple in Jerusalem itself. And uh, the thing was, these God-fearers wanted to worship Yahweh, you know, which in Hebrew just simply means he is. They wanted to, to worship this, this invisible uh, God who was, was present with them in, in all things, uh, but they didn't want to adopt all of the religious requirements that, that different groups of, of, of Jewish individuals, you know, had for, for them to, to, to enter the, the synagogue. So uh, he was most likely one of these god fearers. He worshipped God, but wasn't officially a Jew. And, and our passage tells Tells us that this Christian evangelist named Philip, a leader of the Jerusalem church, he comes upon this powerful African ruler after being directed to the area by an angel. And we read in verse 30, he runs up to the window of the man's chariot and suddenly asks him, do you understand what you're reading? Now, you, know, you just didn't do this in the ancient world. You, you didn't run up to a ruler uh, and, and, and just you know burst into the scene and ask them a question. Uh, it's a good thing it wasn't the Roman emperor sitting in that chariot, or, or rather than answer his question, you know, uh, Philip might have ended up without a head that day or something like that. But this Nubian official is obviously a, a devout, devoted man because he calmly replies, how can I understand unless someone explains it to me? What an enormous amount of humility on the part Part of this ruler. We can already see, you know, that this is a good person, you know, just prepared to, to receive the message of God's love. And, and so he then patiently, graciously invites this stranger to sit with him in his chariot. You know, there wasn't a bodyguard in between. It was just him and, we're told, you know, this African ruler, so that they could study together what the Nubian had just been reading, this prophecy about the, uh, you know, the, in the thir 53rd chapter of Isaiah uh, that foretells Jesus' life. And uh, this official asks Philip in verse 34, tell me please, who is the prophet? prophet talking about, himself or somebody else, to which Philip responds by telling him about Jesus. Well, I know the chariot is traveling along the road here, and, and the ruler at some point, he notices a pool of water 
outside of his window. And he says to Philip in verse 36, What can stand in the way of me being baptized? After which Philip baptizes him. Could you imagine a world leader today just stopping in you know their their limousine getting out and you know being dipped into what was probably the equivalent of a of a dirty puddle um, uh, this was a remarkable person um, it, it's a beautiful story and it shows that this man was was ready to receive God's love but what is equally important is that Philip was prepared to share it. You know, it probably is one of the most unlikely things that Philip thought he would find that day along the road, a a Nubian ruler who was ready to receive Christ on that, you know, uh, road outside of Jerusalem. It'd be like us stumbling upon, you know, uh, King Jong-un or something like that. You know, the North Korean president, uh, you know, in the Greenwood parking lot, you know, uh, reading the Bible. Uh, It's just not something that you see um, uh, every day. But thankfully, as I said, Philip was ready to share because he had allowed God's Spirit before him uh, to to prime him for the moment. Uh, You see, the truth is that depending upon a variety of factors that are continuously changing, different people are more prepared at different moments in their lives to accept God's grace and, and love. This is true of individuals, but it's also true of entire societies, uh, civilizations. You know, uh, the acceptance and, of religion and religious observance isn't a, a linear uh, type of a thing in, in world history. Uh, as if, you know, we, we started out where everybody was spiritual and as, you know, society gets more advanced, you know, we were in this downward trend where people are less and less into religion. Now, cultures go through cycles, uh, some during which people's interest in spirituality wanes, and others during which it intensifies. You know, places of worship fill up, and others are built. We've experienced both of these things in Western civilization cyclically throughout uh, the years. We've experienced it even in our culture here uh, within the United States. Historians have noted trends throughout the years. And and that's precisely why it's so important that regardless of where we are as a culture or where any particular individual is, it's so important that we, like Philip, are always primed beforehand, not only to, to ourselves feel good spiritually, but to share that so that we can do that when others are ready. It's, it's vital that we've expended the time and the effort necessary to be so immersed in God's love ourselves that it becomes a part of the fabric of who we are. Uh, to prune off those things that don't matter, as Noel said today. To, to focus on the things that really do matter. The things that, that light up our, our heart with, with love for other people. The things that build up others. The, the things that, that make us a better person. It's so important that we focus on that. Our passage from St. John's Gospel talks about this very thing. You know, when Jesus is using that imagery of the vine, and, and he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Or as St. John says in another place, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us. This imagery describes us being in God, immersed in his presence. And that's what's necessary for us to consistently bear and share good fruit. Part of that is exactly what we're doing today, you know, making God a priority by worshiping Him. But a part of it also is, is living like Jesus throughout the week. Because it's so easy in our society to, to neglect 
to nurture our spirituality and to allow ourselves to get distracted by all these things that, that really don't matter, you know? Things that, at the end of the day, uh, don't really make any difference. It's easy for us to spend entire days concerned about things that really have no eternal significance. And, and we suffer because of that, because we get distracted from focusing in upon things that really matter. You know, injustice that's destroying people's lives, but, but also individuals who are suffering around us, who we could bless at any given moment during the day. Uh, like that young adult, for instance, you know, who's, who's crying quietly in the corner at the doctor's office after receiving bad news, you know, that, that you know, he, he couldn't have imagined at his age he would have received. You know, maybe he's, he's never prayed before and wasn't interested in God, but, but at that moment, you know, he's, he's open. And, and if we're perceptive, you know, we might be there to just go over and, and offer to, to pray with him if he'd like. And, and it might change his entire life. You know, or that lady walking by us on the sidewalk, you know, with the stern look on her face because she's had a terrible day at work. Or maybe she lost her job, you know, and, 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 and she just feels that the, the depths of, of what a person could feel. You know, who is completely transformed when we genuinely say, how are you doing? Or, you know, we interact with her and in an inspiring way. We don't realize just how much of an effect that can, can have upon someone uh, at the depths. Uh, it, you know, it might seem like nothing to us, but, but it might be something that begins a chain of events that changes uh, a life. Or even that guy who's been tailgating us for the past two miles and swerves around us yelling profanity out of his window on the interstate. You know, uh, his, even his heart could be touched. You know, the, the moment we smile back at him and instead of responding another way, you know, <laughs> how we might, you know, sure, you know, he, he might think we're a little weird you know, uh, by smiling after he said something like that. But I guarantee you he'll be thinking about our smile for the rest of the day and it might change a lot more than just the way that he drives. Uh, and we should never underestimate God's power to work through our expressions of love and compassion uh, wherever we are. But the only way we can share them is if we are attuned, if we're ready, if we're prepared, like Philip was with that African ruler. If we are, God can work miracles in people's lives. Miracles we'll see right then, or miracles that might evolve later on in that person's life. But God will use us in miraculous ways. Our lives will be transformed, and the world's will as well. So may God bless us as we embrace this as a way of life. Amen.